Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Northshire Presents virtual event. My name is Davith Wood. I'm the events manager at Northshire's Manchester, Vermont location. And I'm here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Rachel Person, from Northshire's Saratoga Springs location. Um, we have a great event. I've been looking forward to this so much. But just a few quick things before Rachel introduces our author and presenter tonight. Um, please note that we are recording this event. Uh, but have no fear, only those of us who are unmuted and in this nice little yellow box will be appearing on YouTube for perpetuity. Um, so if you have any questions at any point, please type them in the chat. Rachel and I will save those up and pose them when we get to the Q&A at the end. And finally, just a note of thanks. It has been a hard year and a half for independent bookstores, for Northshire, and all uh, independent businesses of all stripes. And we couldn't be here without you. And so we appreciate the support and you, you're helping us. Um, so thank you so much. And so without further ado, uh, Rachel, please uh, introduce the boss. Thank you so much, David. Um, we're incredibly lucky at Northshire to be partnering with two great organizations to present tonight's event. We had support from our friends at Yaddo and from Narrative 4 for this evening's presentation. Um, Yaddo is a legendary artist retreat here in Saratoga Springs and a vital part of both the local and global artistic communities. Yaddo Presents events at Northshire are part of an ongoing partnership with Yaddo, highlighting the work of Yaddo artists, both in the bookstore in non-COVID times and now, luckily, virtually. Narrative 4 is a brand new friend to Northshire, um, and I hope a continuing one. Um, they are a global organization driven by artists, shaped by educators, and led by students. Their core methodology, the Story Exchange, is designed to help students understand that their voices, stories, actions, and lives matter and that they have the power to change, rebuild, and revolutionize systems. It's been a real pleasure for me learning about their work. Tonight, we are so lucky. This is an event I've really been looking forward to, to be joined by Nawaz Ahmed, who has joined us to talk about his debut novel, Radiant Fugitives, which is a big deal in our world, an indie next selection um, that was listed as a best book of the month by publications including Entertainment Weekly, The Washington Post, Time, and Oprah Daily. It's a book that I found absolutely beautiful and riveting and that I'm really excited to hear more about. He will be interviewed tonight by Ruth Freeman, the artist network director for Narrative 4. She is the author of A Disobedient Girl and On Sal Mal Lane, a New York Times editor's choice book, and is the editor of anthology, the anthology's Extraordinary Rendition, American Writers on Palestine, and Indivisible, Global Leaders on Shared Security. Her new collection of fiction, Sleeping Alone, is forthcoming from Grey Wolf Press in 2022, and I think Davith will be dropping a pre-order link in the chat for that. Please join me in welcoming Nawaz Ahmed and Rue Freeman to Northshire Live. Wow, thanks for that introduction, and it's great to be here, uh, Rachel and David and uh, Nawaz. Um, I'll say very quickly that the Narrative 4 has, uh, one of the things it does really beautifully is bring artists into these classrooms and uh, really settings that go beyond the classroom as well, uh, in a way that is unprecedented in, because, you know, artists, as you can see from Nawaz's work, alone is we, we, we imagine worlds that don't exist. We, you know, we have to do that all the time. So it's a way of uh, having a different kind of mind think about our future than the, the kinds that we rely on right now, which aren't working too well for all of us. Uh, but uh, so uh, having said that, uh, Nawaz, it's wonderful to be here with you. Uh, and I would like to open by asking you to say just a little bit about what the book is uh, so that people who haven't read it uh, and, you know, would get a sense of uh, what they're in for. Hello. Uh, hi, Lou. And uh, thank you, Not Shy Books and Yaru and Narita for, for having me. Um, Radiant Fugitives is a book I've worked on for like 10 years, I think. Um, um, I think the very first paragraph is something I shared with for the first time in public almost 13 years ago, and Rue was present there. Um, it was at this conference, Bread Loaf, a long time ago. and. Uh, since then, the book has grown into what it is now, and I'm so, so excited that it's actually out in the world. And also excited for this conversation with Drew because as she was one of the first writers I met when I went, I was this computer scientist, and I went to this conference having decided 
to have quit my job. And that was my first exposure to people who were doing the work seriously and also people who had books with them. All I was, at that time, I was part of these small writing groups where I'd written like small paragraphs and short, short, short stories. And, and so it's a wonderful thing to be back and talking to Rue about this. Um, what is the book about? Uh, I haven't forgotten that question. <laughs> um, the book follows two sisters, um, Seema and Tahara, one of them who's a lesbian and the other who's devoutly religious. And it follows their frayed relationships in a country, which is the United States, where both sisters have yet to find their footing. Um, Seema was exiled from her family when she came out as lesbian a long time ago. And eventually she finds her way to San Francisco where she has going to have a baby. And her mother Nafisa comes from India and her sister Tahara, who has also settled in the US in Texas with her two children, is summoned to, to Seema's side for a week, just before the delivery. And the novel follows that one week of the delivery, trying where these three women try to reconcile. Uh, the novel is narrated by this, um, by the unborn child or the newly born child of Seema, just mo moments after the delivery. And he is trying to make sense of the complicated relationships between the three women and the very complex world he's about to enter. It is 2010, Obama has just been elected, but the country itself is as divided as the family he's entering into. And I think, if anything, this book is about divisions of that kind. How and how do we work within that, within those divisions? And what are we to do about that? Yeah. Thank you, Nawaz. Um, I think the as you go on, you will realize that all the intentions you have for the book and all the things you put into the book are not always the things that readers and everybody else gets from the book, right? And uh, a book is all, I mean, I think one of the wonderful things about it is that a book is written, you know, you put your heart and soul into it, and then it goes on to live all these different lives with each person who reads it. I think there's a lot like, uh, Kayla Gwynn is one of the people who said, I'm paraphrasing something about like, when you're reading, nobody can tell you, uh, nobody's selling you anything. It's you get to decide what you what you feel about a book. And I think uh, in some ways, each book is a chance every time it's read for it to multiply with a whole new story because that engagement with the person is, is how it changes, right? Um, and so I was, you know, listening to you, it's wonderful to, you know, you're reminding me again of the, you know, all of the different characters and how they interplay and also uh, Tara has two kids and a husband and there's a lot of backstory there, the, the parents of these two girls, uh, the father who's back uh, home still. Um, so there, uh, the boyfriend, I mean, there are so many, so many characters in this, it's, it's, it's really rich in that fashion and, um, um, and, and fun to read because of that. Uh, one of the things I think I noticed immediately is how much Nafisa, the mother, what a big role she plays. Um, even though a lot of the big story uh, action belongs to the people around her, her, her responses to things um, really uh, carry the book in some ways. It's almost like the, the, the unborn child and this, this grandmother who is um, close to death herself, you know, she's pretty old, uh, is struggling with her own issues. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit, tell, tell us a little bit about her. Mm. Um, Nafisa is definitely a character that I think I find great connection with and the narrator Ishraq does too. Uh, the Nishraq is newly born and he's mm. just entering the world and Nafisa is, as you say, I mean, she's not terribly old. I mean, she's in her mid-60s, but she's definitely terminally ill. I mean, right. there is, and she is trying to cope with that knowledge of that her life could, that she has maybe a few months, maybe a year more to live. Um, so I think for me, this notion of birth and death, like they seem to have been encapsulated in these two characters. Here's a newborn 
baby who is going to come into this world and has to deal with how what the world is going to throw at him and nafisa has already in a sense lived her life and she um for her her life is mostly in the past right she knows that she can live only a few more months and i think i wanted that kind of tension like what do you do when you are at that point and how do you look back at the life you've lived and uh, what are the regrets and for nafisa the biggest regret is that the family that she tried to build is divided mm-hmm. the two sisters don't speak to each other the father has exiled one of the daughters and she herself did not do much during her life in order to bring the sisters together mm-hmm. um because for various reasons and the book goes into that and i think it is that here's the baby who wants to know what is this world capable of and here's this person nearing her the end of her life regretting about some of the things she didn't do and so there's this complex territory of regret and hope mm-hmm. and even the mother hopes even in her uh last days she does have hope that she can bring these things together that she can somehow uh somehow overturn the effects of so many years of division and i think there's that hope which is what she comes with and the baby is responding to that and so i think that she's the only character he addresses directly he does do the narration but he addresses her directly like right. here's this connection between somebody newborn and somebody at the end of their lives and this hope that we can somehow go from one place from being born to that place without maybe even without so many regrets and i think you know, that's i mean it's interesting because uh because i guess uh part of the reason why she all of this is bubbling up for her is because she's facing this terrible terminal uh you know diagnosis prognosis i guess yes. um and she's it seems like often times people don't really address the things they should address until they feel like they they're running out of time and you know uh, exactly. look at the climate we're now suddenly concerned about the climate uh, exactly. so it's it's so she uh, and also the unborn who doesn't the, that the unborn child has no notion of what's going on but knows you know certain things and senses certain um disfigurements of relationships i guess between these people and knowing nothing is also a place when you're trying to make the best thing that you can because you haven't suffered all the things that you might have you will and it's those in between people that are running around doing all these things and slamming doors and having fights and these two creatures at the in you know opposite ends yes uh, are really projecting what uh, and that's a beautiful way to book end you know uh, the whole story because there's so many el- so much else that's going on that's really current and um you know with the politics and the elections and the uh, you know profit and all, all of the, uh, the I, yeah i like how you said that these in between people who go around fighting it is <laughs> it is these in between people we like are the in between people <laughs> and that is exactly what we are facing yeah. in the world right now right yeah so but but you also uh, i mean the mothers and the daughters you uh, there are so many scenes because it's a week and and you have them doing very ordinary kind of domestic things like cooking and and i found you know it was uh, i found it so fascinating that the place where you mention uh, the word fugitive from your thing comes in the kitchen it you say by unhurried stages the distinct aroma of biryani assembles itself at first fugitive and evanescent but then lingering longer and longer as though being coaxed out like a shy child in some ways it's almost like you're talking about uh these secrets that are coming out uh as well you know these things that have been hidden uh kept under wraps and now it's all out in the open in this tremendous moment can you talk a little bit about that um a clarification about the word fugitive or the secrets that are coming out well just the you know just the way that you put place all of this uh, action yes. in this domestic sphere and the cooking that plays a huge role throughout as well um yeah 
I, I suppose I had forgotten about that use of the word fugitive. I had, I thought you were going to mention the fugitive, but I think that comes a little later. Yes. But I think this is the first time that it does. Uh, and, and yes, I think that that is definitely such a moment because there are these things, the aroma that is built up in food, especially, and I think the way for a lot of us, food does carry a whole lot of um, emotional baggage. I mean, we have the whole of Proust starting off with the Madeleines and the smell of yeah. Madeleine. So, so that's the thing. And, um, and these smells, these things are very fugitive. I mean, you, it's very hard to describe them. They're there when you see them. Yeah. And the rest of the time, they're like, we, it, we can only refer to them. And uh, and only when you smell it again does that come. And I think that's what this week is for these three mm -hmm. women. They have their past lives from 15 years ago. And they have those memories. And they were happy memories, not of uh, being together, of the foods that were cooked, the festivals that were shared, the um, books that they read together the plays that they acted in, the school days, all that is there and they have this shared language, but they have lost it through the division mm -hmm. and uh, through the fact that um, they are separated or have been. And so I think in this one week, those memories come back really like, like fugitives. Those memories keep mm -hmm. coming, popping in. The mother sees the two daughters reading books at the bookstore and suddenly she is like reminded of how they used to read books as kids. And um, Seema sees the book of Keats in the bookstore and that brings to her this whole uh, past of uh, Tahara, her sister Tahara, who's so religious now, but she also loved John Keats and the romantic poets. And... Uh, and Tara herself, when she sees the book, begins to get immersed in this other world that she thought she had left behind, that she is now has become devout and thinks the Quran is the, is the one text that defines her life. And then there's this other text that fugitively makes its yeah. way back into her life right. and slowly yeah. takes over. And so we have all these uh, emotions that were like, evanescent and now suddenly enveloping them and so yeah. this whole life that they had before is now back again mm. and it brings both joy i think in the moment but also a lot of heartache and pain because they don't know how to deal with it how do you deal with something that you have kept suppressed and yeah so so keats is interesting because tell you know i i was wondering whether there was a reason why it was keats um i mean it fits you know obviously it fits the narrative as it goes along uh so which came first was it keats or was the story and then keats just happened to fall in um i think the story came first i knew i think tahara was definitely interested in poetry and that there was this background of poetry that she had um the question then, when I was beginning to write, is which poet or should I just include all poetry? And it's very hard to write, I think, a book about poetry and just say all poets. So I had to pick. And uh, Keats immediately made sense to me, for one. I mean, we, I grew up reciting Keats. I mean, we also recited Wordsworth. But I did think, <laughs> did you? <laughs> yeah. <Not Asians>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, daffodils and uh, solitary reaper, we grew up reciting those poems. Um, but I have a sneaking fashion, uh, passion for Keats more than Wordsworth. Wordsworth, I felt just like Tahara feels, is, is more elevated and less personal. And Keats is all about emotion, it's really about the person in the world. Mm. Um, and um, so I think Keats felt right. And also, of course, Keats, we know, died young. He was uh, 26, I think, when he died of TB. Mm -hmm. And that somehow also seemed to wrap up with this book, like how when we're talking of birth and death and we already have those things, then Keats' death and knowing that he was going to die influenced so much of his poetry. 
and influenced his uh, his view of life as well. And uh, I think it all made sense that that it would be Keats rather than anybody else. Right, but you also make you give you you give voice to Keats. You give you put words in Keats's mouth. Technically, by Keats speak in your book you know uh, along with other uh, characters that you allow them to just you know you break from the uh, the, go the prose that's going on before which is more narrative uh, and, um, uh, and and you just go into these sections where people are speaking and I would like you to read that section uh, where the Imam Zaya speaks um, it's 18 and right after that there's a little small bit of Keats okay Oh, okay. Um, do you want, oh, 18, okay. Um, just correct. So I wanted to say that there are two ways of, at least, I mean, multiple ways, Keats has put his uh, voice in the book. Uh, two ways in which Keats speaks. One, which I'm, which um, is, almost all of it is his own words. Keats, the Keats section is from, I've cobbled it together from letters, from poetry, from right. various places. So they're all almost all. So I'd just like to say yeah. that while I'm reading it, I I hope the readers understand that it's actually Keats' words, and I don't <laughs> want to take uh, yeah. ownership of those. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just the composition you've composed. Yes, I've letter. composed a Keats speech from his letters and from his poetry. But you wanted me to start from eighteen. Yeah. Okay. The city sinks into the night. Blessed sleep, quiet defender of the still midnight. Close with your careful fingers a gloom beleaguered eyes. Protect us with your watchful attentions, lest the fugitive day slip in and even at our pillows inflict many wounds. Save us from ravaging consciousness that roams ready with sabers drawn. Seal us in root out treachery, expel from us our treasonous minds. 19. Imam Zia speaks. How magnificent the universe is, my brothers and sisters. So vast that no human being can take full measure of its vastness. So beautiful that no human eye can perceive its every beauty. So mysterious that no human mind can comprehend all its mysteries. Yet, every part of the universe, from a massive galaxy to a minute neutrino, follows every law that has been prescribed for it by the Creator, Allah, the Exalted in Might, the All-Knowing. Every part of the universe submits to the will of Allah, which is the essence of Islam, and thus every part of the universe is Muslim. The stars are Muslim. The sun is Muslim. The moon is Muslim. Does not the Quran say, the sun runs his course for a period determined for him. That is our decree. And the moon, we have measured for it mansions to traverse till it returns to its withered state like a stock of date. It is not permitted for the sun to catch up to the moon. Each swims along its own orbit according to our law. And here on earth, every mountain is Muslim. Every ocean is Muslim. Every river is Muslim. They all follow the natural laws that have been laid down for them. Every animal is Muslim. Every tree is Muslim. Every bird is Muslim. From birth to death, every organ, every tissue, every cell in the bodies follows the laws that have been designed uniquely for them. Can the nightingale sing any other song than has been ordained for it? Every note that it sings has been written for it. It can no more change its song than it can shed its wing. But what of man? On the one hand, every man is born Muslim because every part of his body, from the nails on his toes to the hair on his head, is regulated by Allah's laws. His heart is Muslim. His brain is Muslim. His tongue is Muslim. His body is bound to follow every law that Allah has decreed. On the other hand, Allah has bestowed on man a mind, a mind that can think and judge and choose. And with this mind, man has been endowed with a free will. He has the freedom to embrace or deny any faith, 
the freedom to live by any code of conduct, the freedom to react in a way to the conditions of his life. With this mind, he can choose whether or not to be a Muslim. How can man's mind and body be brought in harmony with each other? Only if his mind consciously submits to him whom his body already submits to intuitively. Man completes his Islam by surrendering back to Allah the freedom he has been given, by consciously deciding to obey the slightest of Allah's injunctions. Now, in his feelings, are in harmony with his heart. His thoughts are in harmony with his brain. His words are in harmony with his tongue. Now his actions are in harmony with his body and he is in harmony with the universe. He obeys with both his mind and body him whom the whole universe obeys. He has finally become a Muslim in this brief life. And for that, he will be rewarded for eternity in the afterlife with everything his heart desires with all the joys of paradise. 20. John Keats speaks. Forgive me that I cannot speak to you definitely on these mighty things. Is there another life? Shall I awake and find all this a dream? No voice will tell. No God, no demon deigns to reply from heaven or from hell. You perhaps at one time thought there was such a thing as worldly happiness we arrived at. I scarcely remember counting upon any. I look not for it, if it not be in the present hour. Nothing startled me beyond the moment. If a sparrow came before my window, I took part in his existence and picked about the gravel. Man is a poor folk creature, subject to the same mischances as the beasts of the forest, destined to hardships and disquietude. If he improves by degree his bodily accommodations and comforts, at each stage, there are waiting for him a fresh set of annoyances. The whole troubles of life are frittered away in a series of years, and what must it end in but death? The most interesting question is, how far? By the persevering endeavours of a seldom-appearing prophet or philosopher, may mankind be made happy? Can I imagine mankind's happiness carried to the extreme? In truth, I do not believe in this sort of perfectibility. The nature of the world will not admit of it. This is human life. The war, the deeds, the disappointment, the anxiety, the weariness, the fever and the fret. All humans, bearing in themselves this good, they are still the air, the subtle food to make us feel existence and to show us how quiet death is. Do you not see how necessary this world is to spirit creation, to school and intelligence and make it a soul? Intelligence there may be in the millions, atoms of perception. They know and they see and they are poor, pure, in short, they are God. But they are not souls till they acquire identity. Till each one is personally itself to possess a bliss peculiar to each one's individual existence. How are souls to be made then? How but by the medium of a world like this, affected by three grand materials, the mind, the human heart and the world, acting the one upon the other for years. The world is a place where the heart must feel and suffer in a thousand diverse ways, for the heart is the mind's experience, the teeth from which the mind or intelligence sucks its identity. As various as the lives of men are, so various then become their souls, and thus does God make individual beings from the spark of his essence. I am certain of nothing but the holiness of the heart's affections. They are, they are all in the sublime, creative of essential beauty. Beautiful reading, Nawaz. You know, it's 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 a skill. Not everybody reads their work, uh, you know, with real uh, aplomb as you do. So Thank congratulations you. Thank you. on that. It's uh, um, such a beautiful. I just really liked those uh, that sequence uh, from the city to the imam to Keats and, and this 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 kind of complex conversation uh, declarative you know on every part uh, about what's going on in the world you know just looking at the universe and uh, all our existential crises uh, bubbling forth and uh, so uh, how you know was it difficult to write 
those sections you mean or the book? Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, because you're not unifying so many things. It's faith. Yes. It's uh, you know, and when I say faith, I don't just mean uh, in a religious sense. Uh, I mean in the sense that in the way we believe in anything, we believe in poetry. The faith we have in poetry. The faith we have in politics. Correct. Uh, the faith we have in our relationships with our families, all of those kinds of faiths uh, are, are there, are present Correct. in the book. So, so that's what I'm thinking about here. It, two things about it. Not only was it difficult, it was actually very joyous to write those sections. I think, and that's one of the reasons why I read it with a plomb, maybe, <laughs> because yeah. those sections are. Um, very close to my heart. And I felt like they came out of nowhere. They felt like they fit in the book and um, they felt necessary. And also, I think that moment in the book is something that the narrator is grappling with. I mean, these are big existential questions, like what, what, what are we doing? Where, what do we put faith in? And the baby who has just been born and is now taking these two texts in a way, this Quranic text, which, and this uh, romantic, but mostly a text about how to live in the moment and, mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, and is trying to make sense of those two. And I think, um, to me, I felt like this is a moment of the narrator's growth not just so it wasn't just meant to be like text thrown in for the mm -hmm. for the reader but this is the moment where the narrator himself is grappling with these two texts and what mm -hmm. follows in the remaining whatever part of the book is his uh, because the narrator himself does not interact too much with these characters i mean he's a newborn baby he was within his mother's belly for like the nine months before and he has this few moments before he takes his first breath where he's trying to come to sense like what happened like how do we deal with this world and so those two uh, sermons in a way which is this Imam Zia gives his sermon and John Keats gives his kind of a sermon and uh, so this is the moment where the narrator is trying to fuse his own voice that hopefully comes out later in the later third, later sections of the book where he's grappling with these two very different texts about what, how we place faith and how mm. to look at faith. And, um, and in the light, not only of um, what has happened, because we know in the book there's what is also happening in the country with um, with some of the Islamophobia going on there, but there's also some homophobic things that his mother faces. So there's all this division in the country and there's this division of faith itself, which reflects in, a, in some sense, maybe another kind of division. And so he has to deal with all of this. And I think that... Um, conversation between these two sermons I for me feels like some kind of heart and I'm so glad that you picked that section for me to read uh, because I always wonder there's no story there so should I is it good to read it or not but it's it as I said I read it with the plum because it's so close to my heart right no they're beautifully written and you can tell that it's uh, and i love that you said that uh, it was joyful and i think more all writing should be joyful no matter what even when we're writing really difficult stuff it should be joyful otherwise go do another job uh it, it, it is a it's a joy to be able to write and you know to to indulge that uh, ability to go in all these different places and to break the rules as it were you know to say oh these things don't they seem to belong here i'm going to put them in here even though in a traditional classroom you'd be told oh no 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 you know you can't do that we what, what are you doing where's you know where's this voice where's the other person where's the story but but you but it, it it enriches the entire text so much and in some ways i think those two pieces of those two sermons are there giving these alternative perspectives but in some ways the the difficulties that we all live with come from 
feeling that they are separate, mm. that we can't have both. You Correct. Know? Correct. And, and that's not necessarily the case. No, it's not. Um, yeah. So, so the rest of the story around it is is in some way playing on the on people trying to actually reconcile these two things and try to you know bring them together and be both uh, you know enjoy the biryani but also pray every day you know you know just eat the chicken but also do this yes <laughs> yes, you know, yes honor your mother and father but also love your sister you know all of these things that that they're all okay we, we are we are exactly yeah. exactly yeah um, so um were you going to say something else i was going to ask you something else um no, you want I, to say more about that or yeah i was just going to say no i was just reiterating and i'm so glad and this is why i'm so happy to give the book over to readers because sometimes readers put it so much better than I can. I mean, I wrote the book, but what you're saying is exactly what I intended or, or at least subconsciously intended. I, that's I can't not say readers. That. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. me. That's you. <laughs> that's exactly. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I also, I mean, and it shows because I know, I, like you said, you read that piece from long ago and you know, we were just writing. Um, and then to take the time and trouble to actually follow the story and not rush something just because you need to write a book or, you know, that it that that takes a particular kind of skill, restraint, the, the skill of restraint uh, to not hurry and not rush because you think, you know, you, you know, people might say, well, that Obama election was then, why are you writing about? But no, these things, they're a current that runs through life. So it's, you know, it, the, the time that it took to go through this book and uh, rewrite and rewrite the different places, it really, you can see that. Um, what I wanted to ask you about, you know, given this idea of um, not having to choose between these things is the, a passage where, the, where Nafisa gives this advice. Uh, I, I don't remember whether she was thinking it or she was speaking it about living in America. That little passage, could you just read that little paragraph? With, with the same aplomb, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's on page 308 for me. Yes. <clears throat> so just that little passage, right? Yeah. yeah. Living in America is like living in an in-law's house, you say. When one marries into another family, one needs to learn their rituals. One needs to adjust and accommodate. One needs to continue charming and beguiling well-wishers. One needs to win over naysayers and adversaries by surrendering a little, by learning how to become indispensable to their well-being. One cannot survive by segregating oneself, by giving other re others reason to treat one as an outsider. One survives by learning how to fit in. By the rigidity of her faith and practices, isn't Tahara opening her family to charges of fundamentalism, especially at a time when America has good reason to be suspicious of fundamentalists? Isn't Tahara making it harder for her children to succeed in America by not teaching them the skills they will need to flourish in its culture? If not for herself, she should at least think of her children. This is the lesson to take from the events in Irvine. So... Do you want to talk a little bit more about, you know, what, what, where that little passage comes from, you know, all the politics that are going on in the world at the time, a um, little bit, just a little bit, because I think we, we are, we're going to have to open to questions soon. Yeah, I mean, that section, what um, uh, Nafisa is referring to is the events that um, Tahra disclosed to her the previous night about how the mosque was vandalized, and there was also um the children's the children her tara's children go to a um, islamic school and how the playground was set on fire and um i mean i set the book in 2010 during the time of the ground zero mosque protests there was this whole anti-muslim sentiment that had was just taking over the country partly because of the 2010 midterm elections and the lead up to it and there was a mosque in Arlington, Texas, which was vandalized. And there was um, um, a playground equipment that was burnt. And, um, and there were all 
also around the same time there was also um and a kind of a PSA that some Muslims put out, My Faith, My Voice, which was um, uh, that said, we are good Muslims. We don't want to impose our faith on you. This is my faith. We are good Americans. This is my faith and this is my voice. So I think that uh, is also part of what this is. And I think maybe uh, Nafisa is kind of uh, picking up on that, though she hasn't heard it. Mm -hmm. There is that that same kind of thing that, please, we are good people and uh, um, we are not here to um, make waves of a kind. And, and Nafisa, I think, for her, that's the right behavior. Like, we, you have to give a little. You cannot stick to certain practices if it will discomfort anybody else and um and i i think at that time was both um uneasy about the psa myself i was like is this how we have to defend ourselves like say that we are not a threat to you i mean it's a crazy place to be because every time I've come back around that time and even now I think when I come back um, from returning to the country from outside I usually find myself that either I'm pulled out of line or I have to go through ex extra security the baggage is opened and I have to go through this immigration room that takes me out and asks me questions where have you been what are you doing are you in a sense a good American of some kind and so I think there's this tension at the same time of how do we present ourselves? Do I want to appear non-threatening just because America demands me to be non-threatening? Or are these practices like prayer themselves not, should not be threatening? I mean, so many people go and pray. I mean, we have so many religions here. So this practice of praying should not be threatening. Just the act of praying should not be. And right. so I think there is this tension in the book that stems from that. And we see that again in what's unraveling in the country, in the world. And there are no easy answers to this. How do we present ourselves in a way that is true to ourselves at the same time? Do we assimilate or do we try to build bridges in some other way mm -hmm. that does not mean hiding or effacing some of our um, some of our characteristics yeah. and I think yeah so that's a question that Nafisa not it's not a question it's a why she gives Tahara and Tahara does not take that too well no so no. No, and it, yeah, and in some ways, should she? She, you know. Uh, yes. So, but it's. I mean, it's interesting what you say because coming from Sri Lanka to when I first came to the US, there was a huge discussion going on in the country about prayer in the schools, uh, and I couldn't understand it because I had gone. I was as Buddhist, gone to Catholic convent, and we had prayer in the schools, and it just meant you were quiet and there were prayers. But I could be praying to anybody. I it didn't. You know. Yes, there were Catholic. You know, prayers, but they didn't bother me and none of our prayers bothered us. So I didn't really know why was somebody else's prayer such a big problem for other people. Uh, so anyway, um, I think that we have to go to these, go to questions, am I right? Uh, yes, we have some great audience questions though. I could listen to the two of you talk to each other all night long. This has been just lovely and wonderful. Um, but we do have a couple of questions in the chat that we can start off with and audience members, we should have time for a few more. So if you wanna type other questions, please go ahead. Um, the first one we got was from Elena Richardson of Yaddo um, asking, uh, Nawaz, did your background in science and chemistry impact your sense of huge the huge topics your narrator grapples with such as fate and God and faith and moral responsibility? Um. Computer science is my background, uh, just a small correction. Um, I would have to say, um, I mean, there's definitely the fact that having 
been brought up in the sciences. That's what my background was. We grew up pretty much as an engineer, as a science, and of course, as um, Roop points out, there is really no need to say you can't be a scientist and be, uh, have a faith of some kind. That they are both do coexist. Um, in my in my case, I would say that I would say that faith and uh, that my computer science background really did not affect this book too much. Because what I was trying to do, I think, um, one of the reasons I did leave computer science behind is because of this um, wanting to address things in a, in a slightly larger way than what science can address it. There is actually a section in the book where Naimula, the father, talks about how poetry is something like that, this mysterious something that can capture uh, what life is about sometimes more accurately than science can. Science is like, he talks about how science deconstructs the rainbow, but the rainbow is beautiful by itself. And that's where art and faith and these other things try to uh, capture what life is about in a different way. And so I think for me, that is, where I was coming from. I have this science background, but I also this reaching towards this kind of the ephemeral that science does not quite capture. And art and writing and poetry and even faith does that. Thank you, Nawaz. There's a great question here from my friend and colleague, Joe, a bookseller at North Shore. He says, the family dynamics are so sharply drawn throughout this book. I found myself completely absorbed in the familial tensions, even at the beginning of the book, where the sisters are goading each other regarding the chicken used in the meal their mother has cooked. Do you draw from your own experiences when you write these scenes of tension, or are they sheer imagination? Same question regarding the character's impeccable dialogue. Um, thankfully, I have not had to live that particular scene. <laughs> um, I don't know how I would have dealt with it. Um, it is, I mean, I do have a large family. I mean, my extended family in India. So it is not, the topics of discussion are not topics that I've not heard, not unheard of. I mean, this is an important aspect of, of people's faith, at least as far as it's practiced. So I am, um, so I've heard these discussions, but I have not lived through them. And so the scene is, as in all fiction, is how do you capture that and make it in a way that readers can actually follow? I mean, um, you, and it's a tight rope to walk. At one point, you do not want to make it all about just this one aspect of Islam. Islam is not mainly or even remotely about whether you eat halal chicken or not. That is a small aspect of this larger faith. And so how do you make scenes that work with that? How do you build a, a narrative arc that works with that? And that for me, I think, was in making sure that these characters are fully rounded. It's not just Islam that um, Tahara responds to in the scene. It's also the fact that she thinks her mother has come to her sister's side instead of hers. So there is this other tension that is going on in that scene too, which is how are we relating in that moment to these complicated relationships that are already formed. And I wanted to forefront, not just that she is a religious sister and therefore she's reacting that in a particular way, but also that there are all these other immense pressures on her. She is reacting in ways because she knows that 
her sister may be looking down upon her as well. So there is this intense, uh, immense complexity that I'm trying to bring out in these various scenes. Um, so there's a layering and hopefully people don't read it as one or the other, but there is this layering of all these uh, various aspects of their relationships that is coming out in that one scene with the chicken. And it did require a lot of writing and rewriting to make sure that the notes are clear. Like, where is it not going too far in one or the other direction and pulling back some of the things so that we actually create a scene that is hopefully more complex than about uh, one aspect of faith. Yeah. And I think that's the same thing I hope to do with the other relationships, the other conflicts or the other scenes in the book too, where you have all these various forces acting on these characters and um, I had to find ways to bring them in in ways that the readers can. Sometimes I think maybe the readers won't even catch up on them unless they know that there is this kind of tension in this religion or this there's this kind of um, um, faith and that was okay with me too. Readers are not meant to get everything. Hopefully they get what they can. It's multiple layers. So different people will get different, you know, portions of the book or uh, different aspects of it, I think. I, also, um, I mean, when you talk about those sisters, you bring about this, you highlight, I guess, the way that a sibling will make up for what the other sibling is not doing. So when, when one sibling decides that she's going to, in her, in, in Tara's mind, Seema has decided to be a lesbian. Right. And so Tara then overcompensates in another direction to become this complete, you know, conformist uh, kind of child who is also not necessarily wanted by the parents. I mean, they don't necessarily want that either. So it's like, where is this, uh, you know, so, you, so you're doing both of those things, even in that scene. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Um, and, uh, Correct. I, I, it is that complexity, I think, that I'm trying to capture that we, otherwise we have such uh, easy, simple narratives of why we do these things or why we make these decisions. And I think part of the book is really about how do we come to make these decisions and how they're not these very simple things, how they are such complex things that have so many factors that we try to juggle or we, and sometimes we are not even aware of mm -hmm. in producing, um, in the kind of decisions we make. Well, I, I see that some people are ordering your book and I want to let them know that if you're ordering it from one of the places where, uh, you know, Nawaz has pre-signed, you get his special signature that he practiced for what? How long did you practice that? I did, I took, it took me a few days. Yeah, a few <laughs> days. So that's the measure that you get in the pre-signed books, uh, our, our treasures. Um, I have one in mind, so I was very, I, I was impressed. With those. Yeah. <laughs> it, took, um, it took some doing because I was, I'm not an artist, though I would love to be an artist. And it's like, okay, I, I need a signature that is, that felt that was different from my legal signature for one and also felt like it was artistic in some way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's the last fun thing you can do with the book, right? Because it's now done. You can't fix a karma. You can't <laughs> yes. you know, add a, add a <laughs> new break. Yeah. In break. <laughs> so, um, but what, uh, so, you know, how has this book been received within the family, within your own family? I do not know yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's only been like two weeks. I think my in India the book is not yet released. Okay. But a lot of my current family uh, has is there, okay. um, and my mother I know she's reading it, and I think my others will slowly be reading it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I'm like. I like this period of being in a limbo where I don't know, <laughs> where I still have great hopes of how it will be received in the family. Because once it's, yeah, 
Yeah. But it's also pride, you know, the, there's, uh, there's pride in being able to say, this is this is my son's book, or, you know, this is my cousin's book. Uh, if there's something, there's something lovely about that. So uh, when is it getting released in India? Um, there is an Indian edition that is coming out, I think, end of this month. Okay. Uh, so. But you can get the American edition there, except it takes a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, you know, when you when we started this whole conversation, where you talked about how you you know we met way back when, and you had that one paragraph. Did you happen? To, it's funny you say that because my first book also has its first paragraph was written at at Redlow. So, uh, but uh, do you did it remain in intact? It did not. I mean, okay. it is the ghost of it is there. Yeah, uh, the ghost of it is there, but it's the scene where um, Tahara and Seema, after that dinner, after yeah. that um, dinner with the chicken that they sit and discuss their mother. And that's yes. the scene where they sit and sip tea. And yeah. so the ghost of that scene is there, but of course. Yeah, of course it, it yeah. changes. How, so how, do you feel like it has changed quite a bit from when you first began it? The very first draft that I read, wrote, I mean, the one that I read that paragraph from didn't have the baby narrator. That came almost two years later mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, trying to figure out how do I actually tell the story. Um, so the very first draft, there was this voice who I was not clear who it belonged to. And it took me almost two years to actually figure out who's that voice. And I decided that it was the voice of the baby. Um, so, and after that, I think the family tension remained roughly the same through the course of the mm -hmm. 10 years that it took, maybe lots of refinement, but the thing that was the hardest and we changed the most were the political aspects of the book, the whole central section of the book with Obama, with uh, Seema acting in the working in the campaign for Obama and that I think was the section that changed the most um, mm -hmm. in the last few years of the book because I had to find ways in which that part would be um, narrated that part I mean writing about politics is difficult I think very and I ran into that and there was so much happening in the country and I tended to put everything in the book so I had to like figure out how do I actually make this something that readers can grasp and still have keeping it arc. keeping it in california helped a little bit with the with kamala harris and you know having the california politics also surface so containing it somewhat <laughs> kamala harris was i mean she was there right from the very first draft i mean the first draft of the book because in 2008 i was in a party in san francisco uh, where there were actually volunteers who were volunteering on her DA camp, a district attorney campaign at that time. And that scene was, I mean, that scene has stuck in my mind because it was the first time I was hearing about this uh, Indian American woman who was rising up and people were saying, maybe she's the next Obama at that time. Yeah. And so that, I think, has stuck in the book right from the start, from like 2010, when I started that thing, she was there. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And then you added, I mean, there's lots of other characters too, Correct. you know, different, the, yeah, which I won't, I won't dredge up. There's so much, if for anybody who has not read the book yet, there are, there's so much, so many avenues down which you can go and enjoy it in so many different ways. You know, it's like, uh, you know, we, we talk about uh, column at Narrative Four talks often about uh, books as you, you can enter it on the ground floor and just linger in the lobby or you can climb you know a high rise and uh, experience every single aspect of it and it's all up to you so uh, what a joy that awaits the people who haven't read it yet and i hope they will <laughs> <laughs> and what a joy this evening has been it has been a true delight listening to you two speak about this book and and know as you read from it um, and a gift to have gotten to read an early copy of this book this summer. I, I agree in highly recommending it to everyone here. You can order um, both Radiant Fugitives and Rue Freeman's books uh, at northshire.com. 
Um, the links were in the chat and in your confirmation email. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Nawaz and Rue, thank you for the gift of your time and your words. And audience, thank you for your presence here tonight. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Good night. Good night.